my love and the meditation of my heart be acceptable to the O God, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. Amen. There's a lot of talk about being great. In Hollywood, who's the greatest actor? The Grammys, who's the greatest musician? In the sports world, who is the greatest athlete? And even politically, which nation is greatest? What would it take for America to be great again? So here are the Cliff Notes version. As my cousin Cedric always says, long answer short, here's the problem. If ideas of greatness calls for supremacy, superiority, and salvation through an understanding of your own prestige, you're no longer following Jesus. An idea of one's greatness mixed with a smug sense of self-satisfaction and possessing a monopoly on God's truth will not lead us to the least or the last. Prominence does not lead to the cross, flooded towns, separated families, hospital rooms, or anywhere the suffering call home. I know in this contemporary capitalistic driven society, we are constantly fed the allure of being the most exceptional. I mean, how else do we measure one's life? But the strive to be exceptional is an old one. So here in this ancient text, we have the disciples jockeying for position, arguing among themselves, who is the greatest? The message of this text is central to what it means to follow Jesus. It gets to the core of the meaning of life and what it means to live in the kingdom of God and to be the church. It also shows us how revolutionary Jesus' teaching is. It overturns everything that we thought is true. All of our assumed ideas about importance and greatness are shattered. And here we are told all of the boasting, all of the pomp and circumstance of power, it's irrelevant. Jesus stops this parade and puts it in reverse. Here, the disciples were intent on climbing up the ladder of success, while Jesus is even more determined to descend the ladder of service. Here, Jesus turns our questions of what we're trying to achieve and what it means to get ahead in the eyes of God. Clearly, the disciples had thought their calling to follow Jesus as an opportunity for privilege, power, and position. I mean, yeah, they were there for service, but a service that would eventually benefit them. The last thing they want to think about is the kind of sacrificial outpouring of self that Jesus is about, that the cross is about. So that's why Jesus says to them, the Son of Man is to be betrayed into human hands and killed. And the text says, but they didn't understand him. Because their expectation for the incoming kingdom of God was one of military conquest. Wow, it's going to be great when Jesus takes over. Who is going to be considered the most worthy of us? when he takes his place at the head of all of this. So eager to be rewarded, they don't fully comprehend that the path of those who dare to rock the system, even to throw a rock in the face of it, or even to walk away from the demands of it, is always dead. Like the disciples, how many of us have been afraid to ponder the meaning of Christ's death? Afraid because
because of what the answer might be, what the real answer might be. That we might have to lay our lives on the line. For when you stand with people who have nothing, then you also are most often treated with the same disdain. We like to point to the cross, but before we get to the victory of it, we have to embrace the pain and agony of it. The way of the cross is not pretty. It does not get you the mansion on the hill. You do not pass go, and you don't get $200. <laughs> the way of the cross points the opposite way. It upsets everything. It isn't comfortable because it's about living life as a sacrifice of giving your heart and your mind, your time and your strength as a ransom for others. It's pretty hardcore. And in a world in love with itself, where we are told it's okay, actually preferable to pursue greatness. I mean, we're constantly bombarded with advertising meant to bring to the surface and legitimize envy and covetousness and pride and vanity and greed. For millennia, people have thought or fought about who is the greatest. And these arguments have moved from the bow and arrow to nuclear bombs. And because of this, nations and people stand in ruin. Education isn't often for enlightenment, but as a means to sharpen our claws in the battle of competition. And the urge to be greatest can even get inside the church with the desire for material prosperity and social prestige. We will be here all morning listing all that has turned our attention away from a desire to seek and save those who are really suffering. So Jesus asked the disciples, what were you talking about on the road? And this day, we are to ask ourselves, what are we talking about as we journey with Jesus? What is the main concern of our conversation when we think about who we are as followers of Jesus? <clears throat> what is the position we want to have? Are we sometimes missing the point? So, sitting down, Jesus calls the twelve and calls to you and calls to me and says, if anyone wants to be first, he must be the very last and the servant of all. Suppose Jesus was here and came here to this community and asked to pick out who are our leading citizens. I wonder who would he pick? How would they be measured by this new standard? I'm sure most of the people would be kind of nobodies. People who have never been listed in anything more important than the phone book. Perhaps on Jesus' list might be not the president of a big company, but maybe the janitor at that company. Or maybe it would be someone who visits those who are sick and those who are in prison. Or maybe it would be the Sunday school teacher who just wants to serve. Maybe it would be the person who has little but gives much. Or maybe just someone who smiles despite what they're going through. Or someone who prays for and with others. Maybe it's the person who works behind the scenes for justice without press conferences or news bites. Could it be someone who is willing to be present for others during difficult times? Is it me? Could it be one of you? I want you to consider our ideas of greatness.
whiteness the same as those ideas we had before we came to join the church, before we came to profess Jesus as Lord and Savior, or has nothing really changed at all? Jesus turns our questions of what we're trying to achieve and what it means to get ahead upside down. So how do we get on the right escalator? How do we climb the right ladder? Well, Jesus has an answer, and it comes in a picture lesson. He took a little child and had the child stand among them, taking him in his arms. He said, whoever welcomes one of these little children in my name welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me does not welcome me, but the one who sent me. In our society where children are thought to be the apple of their parents' eyes, our little princesses and princes, we might miss the point here. Because in Jesus' day, children weren't the symbol of innocence or even pride that we think about today. Instead, they were symbols of powerlessness and vulnerability. They were to be seen and not heard. They were non-persons. There were very little interest in children in the Greco-Roman society. And childless Romans who needed heirs often adopted adults rather than be bothered with children. Children are without status. They have no power, and they can't do anything for themselves or others. So this text begs the question, who are the powerless and the so-called non-persons in our midst today? Like, who really needs our help? Who's been overlooked? Who was hurting? Who was hungry? Who was lonely? Who are we called to welcome and serve? That's who represents Jesus. What a seething indictment on this government who has snatched children from the arms of their parents. <coughs> What a seething indictment on those who have closed schools and denied education to those who need it the most. What do we say to those children who become objects of sexual abuse? I want you to think about each of those scenarios. The child of the migrant worker. The child whose parents can only afford public education. The children who live with the threat of gun violence every single day. The children whose innocence is shattered daily. Just take a moment and picture each of these children in your mind and understand right there, right there is the face of God. Right, right there is the spirit of God. Right there is where we're asked to welcome Jesus in the child that's only seen as an object. Welcome Jesus in the child who was dirty and unkempt, in the child who was seen as a bother with no one to show them the way. Right there. Jesus says to us, whoever Welcome such, one such child, one in my name welcomes me. In fact, not only welcomes me, but the one who sent me. This is not a popular thing to do. Well, because there is no worldly profit in serving the so-called useless people of the world. But what a great blessing. I learned firsthand about such blessings when I worked as a consultant for the Illinois Department of Children and Family Services. 
I was to create a program for children who had been raised by the system, most of them taken from their parents because of abuse and neglect. And now they were aging out of the system. And with little education and no family to fall back on, the system was ready to send them out into the world and on their way. Now I must tell you, at first I was overwhelmed by how short-tempered and violent these young adults were. And then I learned their stories. And I heard each case of abandonment. And I heard each case of abuse. Each <coughs> case of neglect. And the experience of being a child who was just invisible most of the time. And scorn the other part of the time. <coughs> and it broke my heart. For these were the thrown away children. And because they had lived lives of criticism and hostility and fear and pity and ridicule and shame, they had learned how to condemn, how to fight, how to be apprehensive, how to feel sorry for themselves, to be envious, to feel guilty every single day. These were the children who were not the apple of anybody's eye. It was heartbreaking. Heartbreaking to see how many hundreds, how many thousands of these children are among us. And it was a challenge to understand who they were. But it was also a privilege to learn how to welcome them into being seen and understood. And I was blessed in the process to provide them with kindness so that they could learn respect, to treat them with fairness so that they could experience justice, to share what I had with them so that they could experience generosity, to give them just a moment of security so that they could learn to have a little faith in themselves. It was transforming. It was humbling. So my friends, do you want to see God? Do you want to really, really dare to look into the face of God? Then look to the child abandoned in the alleyway. Look to the child in the detention center on the U.S. border. Look to the child that the priest is molesting. Look to the child dying of gunshot wounds in his kindergarten classroom. Look to the child their own parent is trafficking. Look to the child drowning in anxiety and depression. <clears throat> Look to the weak, the small, the vulnerable, and the helpless. Look to the ones not in charge. Look into those faces and see God. We like to sing, we believe children are our future, they believe the way we don't believe it. Because if we did, we would do so much better. If we did, we would know there is the face of the holy among us. Dirty, talking back, with an attitude, waiting to be recognized and loved. We got to remember this, that one of the most central and amazing truths about Christianity is that God came to us as what a helpless infant. That people didn't want to be bothered with. And those that heard of him wanted to kill him before he even got here. That's the story of 
of our faith. God came to us as a helpless, vulnerable, child of questionable parentage. So, what would it take for America to be great again? Jesus says that the first must be last and the last must be first. And we are to see God in the face of the most vulnerable. And Dr. King said it this way, everybody can be great. Because everybody can serve. You don't have to have a college degree to serve. You don't have to make your subject and verb agree to serve. You only need a heart full of grace and a soul generated by love. So this week, go forth and look for the face of God. And if you need a place to start, if you need a community to journey with you, we are here, here at Pilgrim. And you are invited to learn more about us in this community and about joining this wonderful congregation after worship at our welcome table. Amen.